So welcome back everybody, in particular John Chaika, who's continuing his mini course on the hard cyclic flow on translation um, surfaces. Please. Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to briefly recall tremors and then and the fact that they commute with the Horus cycle flow, and then use this fact to prove that the tremor of a surface in the eigenform locus, which has a no horizontal saddle connections, is automatically generic for uh, is generic under the Horus cycle flow for the natural measure on a particular SL2R orbit closure. Using this fact, we're going to then show that there's a residual set in uh, the stratum H11 of translation surfaces with two cone points of cone angle 4 pi, which are not generic under the Horus cycle flow for any or any measure at all. Okay, this is a phenomenon. This is a phenomenon that doesn't happen in homogeneous spaces by result of Marina Ratner. Um, okay, so that's kind of an exciting thing. And then I will describe, in the time that remains, I'll describe another set and describe as much of I, as I can of the fact that this is actually in a Hohr cycle orbit closure. It's kind of weird object, but it's a Hohr cycle orbit closure. Okay, that's the goal. So let's begin by recalling what tremors are. So the, for, the, uh, for a lot of today, I want to set notation. And let E be the set of two identical tori glued along a slit. <coughs> so if you recall last lecture, I showed a couple of different copy pictures of things that are in E. You take two identical tori and you draw a kind of parallel and, and on the top of the sides of the, para, of the torus, you draw two sides on it. And then the opposite order on the other copy of the torus, you draw the other two sides and you identify those. And these would give you two identical tori glued along a slit. And there was another picture I drew also of that. And um, we want to assume that our translation surface has area one, nice setting to be in. So your tori should be area one half to begin with. If you get two times one half, you get one. Okay. Now I also want to continue setting up notation. And if I have a translation surface, I want <coughs> capital F to the T with a subscript of M to denote the horizontal flow on M. This is the object we care about. Now, to, at the end of my talk, I described um, tremors. And so there was a set and there was a measure. So I want to kind of make the distinction clear to start things off. If I have an arc gamma, so I'm, I'm considering sets that are horizontally invariant. So the invariant under the horizontal flow, ultimately, you can consider them as being foliated by horizontal lines. And so I could look at an arc gamma, and I could integrate gamma with respect to dx on my translation surface. And I could add to that s divided by the obey measure of u. This is kind of a normalizing factor. And I could integrate gamma over dy, but only on the part that u is on. Okay, and this is a well-behaved object because u is horizontally invariant. Uh, and then I can, on the second coordinate, I can look at the integral of gamma dy. So this actually, as a word for the fact that this is some kind of a nice object, this gives you a cohomology class. And more than that, it gives you a co-cycle. So that's a way in which this is kind of a nice object. Now, we care about measures, so how are measures connected? This is the opposite order I did it in, in class in last time. That if you have an, an, an absolutely continuous invariant measure, there's a good set with this property. So once again, it's going to be invariant of the horizontal, horizontally invariant, and it's measurable. And it gives full measure to mu, and it has no extra points up to zero sets. What does that mean? If I look at where mu doesn't live, but Lebesgue does live, so that's where the radon nicotine derivative of mu with respect to Lebesgue is zero, <coughs> that has zero measure in mu. Everybody happy about this? So this is set can kind of be identified with mu in a kind of very meaningful way. Who's happy? Okay. A fair number of happy people. Okay. And then what we can do is this this map. So um, in coordinates. Um, a translation surface M 
relates, but in our in the coordinates we talked about um, on last lecture and in my first lecture, you can relate it to the integral of over gamma one of dx, comma the integral of the gamma one of dy. So yesterday, last class, I wrote this as um, the horizontal of gamma one and the vertical of gamma one, but I could alternately write it in this way. And you could keep on doing this, and you could do the same thing integral over gamma k dx, comma, integral over gamma k of dy. Okay, so this would be my coordinates for my, tr my translation surface m. And then I can call the coordinates for trem. with respect to mu for time s, what do I want this to be? I want this to be equal to the integral over gamma 1 of dx plus um, s divided by the Lebesgue measure of u of the integral over gamma 1 of chi u dy, where this is a set u for mu as above. It satisfies these properties, comma, uh, the integral over gamma 1 dy. So notice there's no chi u in the second term, and then you do that for gamma 2, gamma 3, da 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 da, all the way up to gamma k. Is everyone happy about this? Okay. So this is what a tremor does in coordinates. It gives you a one parameter family of translation surfaces. And moreover, if you pull back dz from those translation surfaces, it agrees with the cohomology <coughs> class you got there. Okay? They're just not particularly important. Now, in coordinates, it's pretty clear that the tremor commutes with the Horace cycle flow. This is, once again, recalling what we did last time. But I'm going to write this, uh, let's say, us2 of the tremor of m with respect to mu for time s1 is equal to uh, the tremor. Now here's u s1 of m, comma, s1. And of course, I made a mistake. This should be s2. This is my Horace cycle flow parameter. This is my tremor flow parameter. Now, these are two different translation surfaces, and this is going to be an issue that's going to show up at a couple of times in my talk today, which is comparing measures on different translation surfaces. But your horror cycle, or really any element of SL2R, doesn't just give you a new translation surface, it gives you a homeomorphism between these translation surfaces. Okay? And so you can push forward your measure mu by this homeomorphism. And this is what I mean by horror cycles commute with tremors. Is everybody okay with this? This is going to be the key fact in our proof. Okay. Somehow, if I would, the thing that bothers me is that if I would write it, and I would write S1 on the left and S2 on the right. Uh, I don't understand the Like <laughs> The right hand side of the equation, shouldn't it be uh, trem U S1? No, this is done tremoring for time s1 and horror cycling for time yeah, s2. So what in the right hand side? I'm looking at the image of my point. So I have my surface m and I tremor for time s1 and then I horror cycle flow for ah, time s2. So it's also false, of course. US2. Yeah. Okay. Um, everyone happy? Okay. So this is somehow the engine that literally everything runs off of and some semi-continuity properties. So this is a very important point, though it's kind of very trivia, uh, trivial. <coughs> okay, so now I want to state a fact. So tremors can be thought of as kind of semi-continuous objects. Um, and I'm only going to use a tiny bit of the semi-continuity for the purposes, which is very convenient for our purposes. So if uh, m1, comma, da, 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 are all in E, and they're converging to, and uh, the m sub i converge to m infinity, which therefore has to be an e as well. Everybody, 
Wait, where f sub uh, m infinity of t is uniquely ergodic, and therefore uniquely ergodic with respect to Lebesgue measure, then uh, and mu one comma da 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 are ergodic measures. Let's say absolutely continuous ergodic measures uh, for the MI. Then the trem with respect to M sub I of mu sub I of S converges to U sub S of M infinity for all I. Okay, there's an important thing that's going on here which is that the tremor can kind of, the, the tremor space can, can kind of, the, the tremor space behaves semi-continuously. It can kind of collapse, but it can't get bigger. Okay? And that's in a, a key kind of thing that's going on. And in the uniquely ergodic case, it's very obvious to, it's very natural to describe what things are collapsing to. Okay? And so you have this theorem. Okay, let me say a few words. You can take this theorem on fact. I don't, buy, I don't think it's a bad idea to just do this. But you can think about why this is true. So if you look at the kind of description I'm doing here, so as you get closer to something being, you, you, as your measures are approaching your uniquely ergodic measure, these sets are going to be getting closer and closer to being equidistributed in your space, these u's. And so the map you're getting is getting closer and closer to being um, just the Horace cycle map. Indeed, the condition that it's invariant under horizontal lines is telling you that these it, since you're close to something uniquely ergodic, these horizontal lines themselves are very close to being everywhere. And that's the idea. Is everyone OK with that? So m infinity is a, is a fixed point for, for uh... No, M infinity or M infinity, the trem uh, is the same as the, as the whole cycle. Yes, yeah. correct. That's the only allowed tremor because the only such interesting U you can get has full measure. Right? I mean, this formula doesn't make sense if U has zero measure. So, yeah, thanks for that. Any other questions about this? Yeah. So you're relying on some sort of uh, continuity of the integral of chi u over a particular over yeah. some yeah. particular um, yeah. arcs as we go along. I mean, there's a hundred different ways to prove this fact, okay. right? But I, yeah, yeah, there's many different ways to kind of talk about nearby measures on nearby surfaces. One of them is cohomology, which seems to be the way that you're suggesting, which is a great way to do it. Uh, you could also which is very similar. You could choose common triangulations of them, choose piecewise affine maps on those triangles between them. I think they're very similar ideas. OK. Oh, all right. Um, so people are happy with this fact? I'm a bit confused. Too. Yeah. So the new eyes are not like converging to anything in particular? I mean, they have to converge to Lebesgue. That's what's going on here. Yes. Yeah, so in the weak star topology. So if you come up with a, oh, a reasonable way of comparing the measures on m sub i with m infinity, the point is that the there's, it's negotiable how you do it. There's a few different ways. But then these measures are going to be converging to Lebesgue. But that's because the limit is uniquely ergodic, right? In general, they're just going to be an invariant measure. And that's the semi-continuity property. Okay. Because So why do I say semi-continuity? Because any m sub i has a sequence of ergodic measures that has the same property. Right, so things can blow up, but they can't go down. Semi Does that answer your question? Great. Okay. And now we have another fact, which I'll call a theorem. And this is a theorem of Bainbridge, Smiley, and Weiss. Matt Bainbridge and my two co authors. Um, which is that if <coughs> m is an E prism type and m 
does not have a horizontal saddle connection. I'll define saddle connection in a moment. Then M is generic. for um, Lebesgue measure on E <laughs> under the horocycle flow. OK, so I've got, a, um, I've got a few things to talk about. One is what it means to be generic. So this showed up in Manfred's talks. And so I don't feel bad about writing the definition on the board ahead of time. But generic just means you equidistribute. And so what do you do? You build a family of probability measures by averaging your orbit segment, uh, by averaging the orbit of your point along that segment and normalizing it. That gives you a probability measure. OK? So, and then what you want is you want this family of, pro of probability measures to converge for to your Lebesgue measure on this, look, this script E in the weak star topology. Okay, that's all that's happening here. So it's just saying you're equidistributing towards that measure. Yes? Is it implicit in our set capital E that the slit is horizontal? No. Okay. In fact, it's not horizontal. Okay. In that, this theorem is empty. It has empty conclusion on the stack that's horizontal. OK, so I've said the word generic, which probably you guys have heard a couple of times in this, in this uh, winter school. Now I need to define what a horizontal saddle connection is. A saddle connection is a straight line on the translation surfaces that connect two cone points, two singular points for the flat metric. Okay. So if you recall my polygonal representation, imagine you took one of the vertices of these polygons and you have a straight line trajectory that goes to another vertex. That's what a saddle connection is, modulo the fact that some of these vertices might actually be regular points and you might have chosen kind of bad polygonal um, representation, but let's ignore that fact. Okay. Everybody? Yes? Just some precision of the theorem. So it works only for E, or you can basically take any interest cover and you will be happy with the same option. So they prove it for all I inform of psi. And that's what they do. OK, so that's our theorem here. And now we have our proof. OK, so there's a corollary of this theorem which is rather immediate, which is that um, for all epsilon greater than 0 and s, there exists an open set of full measure tremor be close to the horror cycle is an open condition. And the fact here, um, and the fact that uniquely ergodics are an open condition, <coughs> and putting these two together, I, I get the corollary. So this doesn't use Bainbridge Smiley Weiss. Okay? But we're going to obtain the genericity of tremors using Bainbridge Smiley Weiss in this corollary. Is you a subset of me? You, yeah, you as a subset of me. Thank you. Actually, this is true in, for anything, but we care about this 
for a e, 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 e. Okay. So now I'm almost done. Can you explain again the corollary or the the, the, the the proof in the corollary? Um, yeah, so what's the proof in the corollary? The proof in the corollary is this condition is open. That's an open condition. That's how it's proved. And that uses the fact. Okay? The fact is that, that this condition is open. Okay? And unique ergodicity is full measure. So now I'm going to state the next theorem. So this is a joint theorem of myself and uh, Smiley and Barak and John. Okay, and what's the theorem? The theorem is that if M is an E and uh, has no horizontal saddle connections, And mu is an M absolutely continuous and uh, uh, a, a mu is an absolutely continuous horizontal flow and very ergodic measure. Then um, M is horocycle flow generic. I'm sorry, tremor of M with respect to mu for time S is horizontal flow invariant, is uh, horocycle flow generic for call this mu sub E. The Lebesgue measure on E. Let me talk through this. So I have some kind of surface on E, and I want to assume it has no horizontal saddle connections. And I want to assume that I have an absolutely continuous FT of M ergodic measure. Then I look at the tremor of my surface for a certain time, and then I look at its US orbit, and it will equidistribute for a measure on E. Okay. Let me already say that this is different than what you see in homogeneous dynamics, because when you, we have an involution on the set E which exchanges our two tori, it exchanges the copies of the two tori, and it will change my measure mu for to the other absolutely continuous invariant measure in this class, right? This is recalling things from lectures two and three in my mini course, okay? So this measure is asymmetric in the two tori, and in particular, tremoring with respect to it will break the symmetry of the two surfaces. Um, give me a minute. Um, it, it will break the symmetry of the two surfaces. And so this tremor won't be in the locus but it will equidistribute to a measure that lives on our locus E. And this never happens in homogeneous dynamics. The measures that you equidistribute for and live on your orbit closure and are very nice on your orbit closure. Okay? And in particular, this point isn't even in where the measure it equidistributes for lives. It's at positive distance to the support of that measure. Yes, Samantha? Is this there for all S that you can get this? Yeah, this is for all s. Uh, poor choice of variables here. Let me change this s to an l. For all l, because I was using s as the variable here. This is for all l. Okay. Doesn't matter how long you tremor this for. And this is going to be important for our residual set of points that don't equidistribute. That's true for all l. It's for all l and for all s. You, the, 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 this is just notation for, to talk about the flow, right? This S isn't really doing anything. Okay, so what's the proof of this? The proof of this is that by basic kind of, by the theorem of Bainbridge Smiley Weiss, proof by Bainbridge Smiley Weiss uh, and the corollary, 
Uh, yeah, let's say by then you're just smiling waste. If U is an open set, No horizontal solid connections. Then the set of S, so that U sub S of N is in U, has lower it has full density, has density one. Where then um, where density means lower density. Okay, this is just kind of basic facts about weak star convergence. You can be bigger than the measure of the set, but you're between the measure of the set and that plus the measure of its boundary when it's open. This is what's going on there. Everybody okay with that? Uh, is anybody okay with this fact? This, this is a very basic kind of ergodic theory argument. Um, Nobody's okay with this. Am I correct about this? Who does it, raise your hand if you're okay with the, with this statement here, the, the statement in you, you are applying the ergodic theorem for the characteristic function of u. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So. yeah. That if you so so you so the amount of time you spend in an open set is. At least, and if you equidistribute for a measure, it's at least the measure of that open set, and it's group, at most the measure of the closure of that open set. Okay. Now, if the measure of your open set is one, the least is the most it could possibly be, and you're done. This is the basics from going from weak star convergence to what this is saying about uh, measurable sets. It's called the point run toe theorem. Okay. It, Who's with me at this point? I'm with me. Almost nobody's with me. Does anybody have a question? You're using the definition of U.S. generic? Yeah, yeah. I'm just using what it means to weak star converge and what that <coughs> says about sets. Who's seen weak star convergence before? Okay, who's seen the portmanteau theorem before? Oh, that's the problem. Okay, so what does the portmanteau theorem says? It says that if I have a set of measures, so if mu sub i are converging weak star um, to some measure mu infinity, and u is open, then the limit, let's say the limb soup of the measures the new sub i of u is equal to new infinity, uh, I'm sorry, is less than or equal to new infinity of u closure, and the limit inf is greater than or equal to new infinity of u. And this is true for measurable sets, but you want to remove boundary. You want to here remove the me new infinity measure of the boundary. You need to worry about that. And here you want to add in the boundary. And I think this is what we're using with the portmanteau theorem. Okay. So now, if you have um, an open set, this you're fine. This part will give you that you'll go to having full measure to it. Right? What you're doing in generic points is you're averaging along the orbit. So you're looking at those times when you're in the set U, right? Your new, your new I will be for some time T. You'll be looking at the times at which you're in U. And you'll be converging to what new infinity gives you. But this is a set of new infinity measure zero. That's full time. OK, who's with me now? OK, great. We've improved this. OK. Okay, so now we're basically done. So let u be the set as in the corollary. Let u be as in the corollary. Um, uh, if u s of m is in u, 
Now for NES, um, U sub S of trem of M with respect to my measure mu for time L is going to be equal to the trem of U S of M with respect to my measure mu, pushed forward by u, but I'll suppress that for time out. Right? This is my key commutation relation up on that top board over there. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, if u sub s of m is in my set u here, what this is going to basically be is this is going to be basically u sub l of uh, u sub s of m. And this is under the assumption that u sub s of m is in u. Can you raise the board, please? Right? You, if I choose to set u for tremoring for time l, then that's saying that I'm very close. When I tremor for time l, I'm very close to horror cycle flow for time l. Right? So once I've got my tremor on the outside, and I've got the argument for it in my good set, that might as well be a horror cycle. Okay. And now since this is true on a full density set of times, you're going to equidistribute for the same measure. Everybody okay with that? Somehow very little is going on with this. Who's with me now? So the important thing here is that this image of the horror cycle flow is again another tremor, in particular a tremor of something whose horror cycle orbit was already in you in the first place. That's this is what's important. I think you're trying to say how the co commutivity is used. Yes. I understanding the horror cycle flow of objects is a hard thing to do. Bainbridge, Smiley, Weiss, let us tell a little bit about this. Um, and so what we do is we replace our horror cycle flow with the tremor of the tremor of the horror cycle flow. And usually by Bainbridge, Smiley, Weiss, and the hidden semi-continuity statement, oh, wait, the semi-continuity statement, where's the semi, the hidden semi, the semi-continuity statement, which is the fact up there, the semi-continuity statement with the fact up there, most of the time your tremor is going to look like basically just a horror cycle. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, yes. I thought we had to change the measure, though, for the tremor under the, conjug the conjugation relation. Like, why don't we... Yeah, I'm just, in, in interest of time and notation, I suppress that. You can identify the things that I'm suppressing the homeomorphism that identifies them. Okay. okay. Um, Okay, any other questions on this? I think a lot of people are confused, and I personally don't know where you're confused, so if you ask questions, it might help. So what you showed us is that uh, uh, BSW says that uh, no horizontal con uh, saddle connection imply genericity for home cycle. Yes. Right? And, and you say, okay, this set is almost invariant at the terminal. Oh, ah, but you go out of, of E. You, you generate more uh, generic points by yes. applying thermal, but you have an extra condition which says that you need to be a non-generic uh, object in the sense that you, yes. you have a, yeah. an absolutely continuous non lagrangian measure. Correct. And so in order to now say things about zero sets, you, that, you use the Portmanteau theorem to say that even your zero set the orbit of your zero set is going to behave nicely with respect to open sets. Mm -hmm. And here's where the semi-continuity of the tremors come in to let you transfer the closeness into be an open condition. But did I get it correctly that you have, you have your E, mm -hmm. and only if you have a null set, which is the set of surfaces with, a, with an absolutely continuous yes. F, and yeah. then those are kind of rare points, but when you apply tremor, mm -hmm. you go out of E, 
Correct. You go out. And of it. you get to a point where uh, they actually collapse on E under the power cycle flow and generate the, the, the standard measure. Correct. And the reason why is that, in some sense, still on this zero set, most of their tremors are very, very close to being horror cycles. Mm -hmm. And then you use the commutation relation. OK? Um, uh, so, so it collapsed. Two, is it true that these two, it's like moving in the stable direction? No. no. So, so measure theoretically, yes, but topologically, no. It's very possible for you to infinitely often move off of E again. But you spend you you deposit zero weight to those times. I see. Did that answer your question? I think so. So ignoring like a, a, a zero density set of times, if I shut my eyes, yep. I actually see something on the st on a stable. Yep. Okay. Or, or no, you see something that yeah. that's as far as you can tell is in E. It's actually in E. But if, if you don't it's have it's a only in E, it's, it's kind of a collapsing on the orbit of my, my orbit. Oh, uh, I don't want to go that. I don't, I don't want to talk about quantitative speeds of it actually going that. I don't want to worry about that. Okay? We don't need that, so let's not say stable. Any other questions? Okay, great. I have a question about the statement. Sure. So, what we're, what we're trying to get to is we're trying to show that the tremor is U.S. generic for mu epsilon. I mean, I mean mu. The Lebesgue measure on E. But that's the Lebesgue measure on E, but then the tremor is not even in E. Yeah, that's why this theorem is cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's the point you're point. This can't happen in homogeneous dynamics. And so what's the, you, what was Yuri saying? He was saying you start outside, and then for a full measure set of times, a full density set of times, all those times outside of the set of density zero, you're microscopically close to E, right? And on that zero density, I say nothing about what's happening. Fine. Um, yeah, it's a little crazy. Yeah. Okay. In any case, does anybody have other questions on this? Because I. Okay. Um, did I answer your question or did I avoid your question? You can go on. Okay. Um, okay, so now what's the corollary of our theorem? Okay, so let's state another fact. Um, if M tilde is equal to trem of uh, M comma mu L for some M in E, then um, A B zero A inverse of M tilde uh, has a similar description. Indeed, it's going to be, I guess, a squared L trem mu uh, u b of m. Uh, Okay, I'm going to get this wrong, but the statement is that the, this group sends tremors to tremors. It sends tremors of surfaces to tremors of surfaces. And there's some combinatorics, some numerology going on in the way it does it, but it's completely explicit, and that's what you get. Everybody okay with that? And then there's another fact, which is due to, which is, combines a few big theorems. So this is due to McMullen. And Eskin knows Akani Mohammadi. In what sense, this in the sense that you have to compare combine results of these two people, of these two groups of people, um, in order to get the fact that I'm stating here. And what's the fact going to be? The fact is going to be a closed set
of uh, the set of translation surfaces with two cone points, each of angle 4 pi, that contains E. And is invariant under this group. Is star, star, zero, star invariant. Is uh, and contain, can, that contains E and is that, that is either E or the whole space or H. Okay. So this is some kind of big fact. What did Eskin, Mirza, Kani, Mohammadi did do? They showed that any set that's closed and invariant under this group is actually invariant under all of SL2R. And McMullen classified SL2R closed invariant sets in H11. Uh, him and Kalta did it in H2, in H11. And he said that there's no intermediate ones between E and the entire space. Is everybody OK with this? Okay. And so what's the corollary of this fact? The corollary of these two facts is that the set of uh, the set of M, so that M is U uh, generic for E is dense in H11. Okay. So you get the invariance by this, and what you end up is a set whose closure contains E. Why does the closure contain Z? If you put A being equal to 1 here, and you look at the B orbit, the genericity gives you that the closure, the fact that this is, that, M, that the tremor is going to be um, Generic under the Horace cycle flow for E means that the orbit closure of the tremor has to contain E. Okay? So you get that from any one of these points. You look at its Horace cycle orbit, you get E free of charge. Because you have a point that you started with that isn't an E, once you have invariance under the diagonal subgroup, you're automatically dense. So E plus one other point and invariance under the upper triangular subgroup gives you density free of charge. You get your point from the tremor, you get E from the genericity, that's the proof. Who's with me on that argument? Okay. Does anybody want to ask a question? Because most people aren't with me. Okay. Can you maybe comment why is that surprising? I mean, once you once you showed us that it's not surprising. This is not surprising. I mean there's a there's a couple of very big theorems in there, but okay, you're allowed to put big theorems. All right, so now, what's the next theorem we're going to state? It's going to be that there are uh, don't equidistribute, a lack of equidistribution. Um, OK, so this is the next theorem. Do you need tremors for that corollary? Like, could you get that corollary? Could you get that corollary? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how you would get that. So I think you need tremors to even get one surface that's not an E that equidistributes um, uh, to, to, the, to the measure. It's surprising that there's any that aren't an E that equidistribute to the measure on E. That was your, I think that was your earlier question, right? It's starting to make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, but this should be surprising. I hope it's surprising. <laughs> So the dichotomy says that this set that you've given is either dense in H11 or dense in E. But the fact that you have given examples of things that are US generic for E that aren't in E forces it to be the latter rather than the latter. Correct. <coughs> This distance function just kind of an arbitrary distance function? Yeah, that? so long as it gives the topology, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, implicit in this talk is the one on period coordinates, which isn't the best distance in the world, but you could do, say, the Villa Gozel Yoko's metric, that would work just as well. Whatever your favorite metric is. 
One coming from the Hodge norm. OK. Um, all right, so now uh, I want to state the next theorem. <coughs> Essentially, it will just be a corollary. <coughs> the set of surfaces, a uh, set of M in E, so that um, M is not U.S. generic for any measure. But the residual sets are the big sets, according to the statement of the bear category theorem. They're dense G-delta subsets of complete metric spaces. Now, what's, how does the proof go? The proof of this is essentially a corollary of some trivialities, OK? Of what we've done before, plus tri trivialities. Now, I want to generalize the notion of generic and I want to say quasi-generic for new, if there exists an infinite sequence T sub i going to infinity, so that for all this, T sub i, and here I take this as i goes to infinity. Sorry, M in E or M in H11? H11. <coughs> oh, thank you. It's H11. In fact, Smiley and Weiss show that this it, that the statement I wrote is very false. In fact, their H11 actually does behave like homogeneous space. Every point equidistributes to some measure. In E. It, it, I'm sorry, E. E. I'm sorry. Every time it, it seems like just change every time I say E to H11 and H112. Okay. Um, so if I come up with the idea of quasi-generic if there exists a T sub i, so you don't necessarily have a limit. I just want to ask whether you have a limit. The set of points that is quasi-generic with respect to a measure is a G delta set. So uh, the set of y, so that y is quasi-generic with respect to nu is residual if it's dense. Right? For any given function, you can ask to be epsilon close, and that's an open condition. There's only a countable number of functions that matter, and you can restrict your attention to a countable number of epsilons. So, so long as this is dense, you can write it as a countable intersection of dense open sets. Okay? And so it's residual whenever it's dense. Okay? And so the point is that the set of points that are quasi-generic for two different measures are both residual sets. So proof. The set of M. So that M is US generic for the big on H11 is residual. And then the same thing here with the big on E is residual. That's what we just, um, that uses the density. And just the fact that being quasi-generic is a residual property. If you're actually generic, you're automatically quasi-generic. That's how you get the density. And saying the word quasi is how you get the G delta property. From, and then you put those together, and you get re residual. Okay. And this is what we have here. And then by the bare category theorem, the intersection is residual. By bare category, the 
intersection is residual. All right, any questions on this part? But it still something seems false here because um, what you told us about the points that you get by this dense set of points in H11 that you built by mm -hmm. by going in the Trenor mm -hmm. direction out of E yes. from mm -hmm. this uh, sparse set of surfaces, these satisfy that along the uh, U, yep. US trajectory uh, for any epsilon, mm -hmm. most of the time they were epsilon close to E. Yeah. So how could they... So if the it's set of e, points that we produce that don't... Uh, um, equidistribute for any measure haven't shown up on the board anywhere. They're, we just, they, they're just hidden in the bare category argument. You have a residual set, which is, oh, sorry, US quasi generic. I left off the word quasi. Quasi generic. Okay, so the set that's generic for LeBeg on H11 is dense, but is a meager set. The set that's generic for E is dense, but is a meager set. Okay? The set that quasi-generic will still be dense, because they contain the generic sets, oh. but they'll be G-delta. That's how it happened. So sorry if we're leaving out the word quasi. I think that's what confused you. But it, somehow, but hidden in what you're saying is that uh, when you go from the requirement of generic to quasi-generic, you, you immediately, just because of abstract nonsense, you blow up the set, right? In, in the sense of descriptive set theory, it becomes right. a big set. So, but this is already a, a non-homogeneous phenomenon, right? Because from, uh, from the homogeneous dynamics point of view, if you have a point with the, which is quasi-generic for you, it's automatically generic for you. Correct. So, but we only produce these using this bizarre bare category argument. And so this is a high, so I'm building a lot of interesting no, phenomena. I'm here. taking the logic that you're, that, yeah. you're, that you're saying now, and I'm asking myself, why can't I prove existence of badly behaved points in Gmod gamma this way? Yeah, so then, one thing is, this first theorem can't happen in homogeneous dynamics. You can't have a point outside of the support of a measure that equidistributes distributes for that measure. And that's the starting point of this whole business where you get extra, where you have invariance. So there's a group, you get density, density blah, 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 blah. This is right? why the density is so yeah. important, even though it's. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just say a quick remark. I want to be clear that I've got a lot of questions on this because I really don't know what's going on in a lot of things. I have these theorems I can quote, which are very powerful theorems and wonderful theorems, but they're completely. They're kind of miraculous, right? All of our arguments are about these very special sets that we control very well, and then we're concluding things about other points existing somewhere that we have no idea what they are. Right? Yes? So you're taking the set where it's quasi-generic for LeBay, mm -hmm. residual intense. The set where it's quasi-generic in LeBay, I mean, I mean for, for E. Is generic intense. Yeah, LeBay that E. Yeah, is residual intense. You're taking the intersection of these two. So mm -hmm. by very category, that's again residual. And since now, this intersection contains things that are quasi-generic for this thing and that other thing. They can't these be. These things are therefore not generic for, for anything. anything. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So um, I think I'll end with the statement of one more theorem that I won't really have any time to say anything about, at least today. And maybe I'll do a vote. So we have one last theorem. Mm -hmm. So let E min be the set of M and E with most horizontal saddle connection. <coughs> okay, 
so these are things that have, they're guaranteed to have a minimal horizontal flow. Um, then what I can do um, is uh, I can let, I, I can look at the union over M in E min. over the union of nu and f t to the m ergodic measure, probability measure, and I can look at the tremor of this m with respect to this nu for time l, and I can take the union of this for l say less than or equal to R, okay? And this is a Horace cycle closure. Of Hausdorff dimension. Uh, between five halves, but strictly less than six. So this is an open bracket here. I've made many typos, but this is not a typo. Strictly less than six, and in particular, it's non-integer Hausdorff dimension. Um, this is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I left out the closure part. You take the closure of this set. That's now um, an, a Horace cycloorbit closure of fixed Hausdorff, of some Hausdorff, fractional Hausdorff dimension, and this also never happens in homogeneous dynamics. Is there a lower bound on L? Uh, for all L. For all L, you get one of these. I'm sorry, for all R, you get Oh, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's the same object if you take this, uh, if you put a negative R here, or any number um, between negative R and zero. Okay. It's also the same object if you erase, if it's just exactly R the same object. So this is kind of a funky object. In particular, if you look not at the cloak, if you look at the guys you get for less than r, strictly less than r, and you subtract it from this, when you have less than left is g delta in the set you started with. This is a weird object. So when you have a horizontal set of connection, uh, can you explain why new exists? Like you said, Okay, so there's two cases. The case where the horizontal saddle connection separates the surface, or comes in a pair that separates the surface. And there, you have an invariant measure because your surface is separated along the horizontal. But you'll never cross this separating object. Okay. Right. Are there other questions on the statement of this theorem? Yes? Are the surfaces in this set still all tremors? They're all tremors. Okay. Yeah. Great question. Uh, any so other questions? For the top theorem, it, is that a US quasi generic misstatement also? Or is no, every measure is automatic. Thank you for asking this. I made so many typos. But every measure is quasi generic for every point is quasi generic for some measure, oh, yeah. basically by kind of compactness arguments. Well, this isn't a compact space, but it's almost compact. There's good ways of controlling the non compact part. Um, yeah, so we can't negate quasi genericness. That's impossible to do, but we can negate genericness. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks for it. Any other questions? So in this theorem, the, the Fractional Hausdorff dimension is coming from the base or from like from like the epsilon mean or from because like epsilon is like a manifold I presume for like yeah and then so that has like so the, the, let me suggest a little bit so the set of surfaces in the so this has full Hausdorff dimension you're subtracting something of strictly smaller dimension <coughs> from this because the hot condition of being having a horizontal saddle connection is a co-dimension one condition okay. Now, in this locus, there, it's a five-dimensional locus. There's a four-and-a-half-dimensional part where you have a non-trivial tremor. The five-halves come from the four-and-a-half plus one, and the less than six takes work. Did that answer your question? Um, are there any other questions? Well, then I'll end this with a question for you guys. What do you want to do in my last lecture? I'm one lecture behind, essentially. 
do you want me to, the options are I can uh, state, I can do as much as I can of the proof of this theorem, um, which also uses uh, Headland and the bare category theorem, um, or I can give you 12 questions that I have about tremors and horocycle orbit closures. Um, yeah, so those are the two options. Who would like me to ask you guys questions in my fifth lecture? Okay, so that's like six people. And who would like me to explain as much as I can about this theorem? Um, one, two, three, four. With some multiplicity, there's about six different people. Let me ask them <laughs> what again. We need more voters. More people need to vote. Who wants me to explain as much as I can of this theorem? Okay, and who would like me to ask questions to you guys? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, maybe, since it's evenly divided, I'll say a little bit about the proof here, take about 20 minutes or so, and then I'll have at least 20 minutes to ask, I don't know, five or six questions. Okay, thank you guys for your time. <laughs>